Madam President, Chairman of the Board of Trustees, members of the board, distinguished faculty members, parents, other family members, friends, and to the class of 2009. Thank you so much for this great honor. I'm delighted and very pleased to be with you on this important occasion. To each and every one of you who are also receiving a degree today, congratulations. I wish you well. I wish you much success. You must go out into the world and continue to build what I like to call the beloved community, an all-inclusive community that recognizes and respects the dignity and the worth of every human being. You heard in the introduction that I didn't grow up in a big city like Boston. I didn't grow up in a big city like Springfield. I didn't grow up in a big city like New York or Chicago or Atlanta or Washington. It is true that I grew up on a farm in rural Alabama, 50 miles from Montgomery, outside of a little place called Troy. It is true that my father was a sharecropper, a tenant farmer. But back in 1944, when I was four years old, and I do remember when I was four, my father had saved $300, and with the $300, he bought 110 acres of land. My family still owned the land today. On this farm, we raised a lot of cotton and corn, peanuts, hogs, cows, and chickens. I know as students of this great college, Emerson College, you're smart, you're gifted. You know how to write great stories. We heard a marvelous speech from the student speaker. You heard great comments, great statement, and address from your president. I know you're smart, but you don't know anything about raising chickens. <laughs> Let me tell you what I had to do as a young boy growing up in rural Alabama during the 40s and the 50s. It was my responsibility to care for the chickens. And I fell in love with raising chickens like no one else could raise chickens. I know some of you know something about Kentucky Fried. But you don't know anything about raising chicken. And to take these fresh eggs, mark them with a pencil, place them under the setting hen, and wait for three long weeks for the little chicks to hatch. Some of you may be saying, now John Lewis, why do you mark those fresh eggs with a pencil before you place them under the setting hen? Well, from time to time, another hen would get on that same nest, and there would be some more eggs. And you had to be able to tell the fresh eggs from the eggs that were already under the setting hen. Do you follow me? Well, that's okay, you don't follow me. <laughs> when these little chicks would hatch, I would fool these setting hens. I would cheat on these setting hens. I would take these little chicks and give them to another hen. I'd put them in a box with a lantern, get some more fresh eggs, mark them with a pencil, place them under the setting hen, encourage the setting hen to stay on the nest for another three weeks. I kept on fooling and cheating on these setting hens. And when I look back on it, it was not the right thing to do. It was not the moral thing to do. It was not the most loving thing to do. It was not the most nonviolent thing to do. It was not the most democratic thing to do. But I kept on cheating on these setting hands. I was never quite able to save $18.98 to order the most inexpensive incubator or hatcher from the Susan Roebuck store in Atlanta. So I kept on cheating on these setting hands. Now, maybe not in Boston or in New England, but we used to get the Susan Robot catalog. It's a big, thick book, heavy. Some people call it the Orin book. Some people call it the Wish book. I wish I had this, I wish I had that. So I just kept on wishing. But as a young child, I wanted to be a minister. I wanted to preach the gospel. So from time to time, with the help of my brothers and sisters and my fresh cousins, we would gather all of our chickens together in the chicken yard, like you would gather here. And the chickens, along with my brothers and sisters and first cousins, would make up the audience of the congregation. And I would start speaking or preaching as a young child. 
And when I look back on it, some of these chickens would bow their heads. Some of these chickens would shake their heads. They never quite said amen. But I am convinced that some of those chickens that I preached to during the 40s and the 50s tended to listen to me much better than some of my colleagues listen to me today in the Congress. As a matter of fact, some of those chickens were just a little more productive. At least they produce eggs. <laughs> As a young child growing up in the heart of the American South, I tasted the bitter fruits of racism. I saw segregation and racial discrimination, and I didn't like it. I saw those signs that said white men colored men, white women, colored women, white waiting, colored waiting. On a Saturday afternoon with some of my brothers and sisters and first cousins, we would go downtown to the little theater. And all of us little black children had to go upstairs to the balcony. And all of the little white children went downstairs to the first floor. I would come home and ask my mother, my father, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, why segregation? Why racial discrimination? And they would say, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way. Don't get in trouble. But as a young child, 15 years old, in the 10th grade, in 1955, I heard about Rosa Parks. I heard the words of Martin Luther King Jr. on an old radio. When I heard his voice, I felt like he was talking directly to me. I knew then that it was possible to strike a blow at legalized segregation and racial discrimination. I decided I made up my mind as a young child to get in trouble. I decided to get in the way. It was good trouble. It was necessary trouble. So I appeal to you as graduates, get in trouble. Good trouble. Necessary trouble. I appeal to you to be a good and raw courage. Be not afraid. The most pressing challenge in our society today is defined by the methods we use to defend the dignity of humankind. But too often, we are stuck in the trapping of a comfortable life. If you want a better society, a more fair, more just society, you cannot wait for the President of the United States. You cannot wait for members of Congress. You, the leaders of the 21st century, you must do it. Through your own efforts, through your own creativity and vision, you have to do it. You must make our society a better place. I was so inspired by Martin Luther King, Jr. that in 1956, at the age of 16, with some of my brothers and sisters and first cousins, we went down to the public library in the little town of Troy, Alabama, trying to get library cards, trying to check out some books. And we were told by the librarian that the library was for whites only and not for colors. I never went back to that library until July 5th, 1998, by this time I'm in the Congress, for a book signing of my book, Walking with the Wind. And hundreds of blacks and white citizens showed up. It was like a big family reunion. We had food, we had something to drink, I signed a lot of books. At the end of the program, they gave me a library card. It says something about the distance we've come and the progress we've made in laying down the burden of race in America. But just think, a few short years ago, about 40 or 45 years ago, another generation of students, another generation of young people literally put their bodies on the line. All across the American South, People could not register to vote simply because of the color of their skin. The state of Mississippi had a black voting age population of more than 450,000. Only about 18,000 were registered to vote. 
There was one county in my native state of Alabama, Lowndes County between Selma and Montgomery. The county was more than 80% African American, but there was not a single registered African American voter in the county. People stood in unmovable lines. In Selma, Alabama, you can only attempt to register on the first and third Mondays of each month and the only place for the county courthouse. You had a sheriff there who guarded the courthouse like it was his own home. He wore a gun on one side, nightstick on the other side, carried an electric cap rider in his hand, and he didn't use it on cows. He wore a button on his left lapel that said never. But it was my day to lead a group of people down to the courthouse. He met us at the top of the steps. He said, John Lewis, you're an outside agitator. You're the lowest form of humanity. At that time, I had all of my hair. I was a few pounds lighter. I looked the sheriff straight in the eye, and I said, Sheriff, I may be an agitator, but I'm not an outsider. We are going to stay here until these people are allowed to register to vote. He placed us all under arrest. And a few days later, when we attempted to march from Selma to Montgomery, we were beaten, trampled by horses, bull whips, was hit in the head by a state trooper with a nightstick, and had a concussion there at the bridge. I thought I saw death. I thought I was going to die. But I didn't give up. I didn't give in. I didn't give out. I kept the faith. I kept my eyes on the prize. And I said to you, graduate, your generation must not give up. You must not give in. You must keep the faith. You must keep your eyes on the prize and keep pushing and pulling and make our world a better world, make our country a better country. You can do it. You must do it. Just think a few short years ago. Hundreds and thousands of young people from the greater Boston area, religious leaders, rabbis, priests, nuns, ministers, came to Selma, came to Mississippi. The summer night of 1964, June 21st, 1964, three young men that I knew, one a student, went out to investigate the burning of an African-American church. These three young men were arrested, taken to jail, and later that night, they were taken from jail, beaten, shot, and killed by the Klan. Six weeks later, their bodies were discovered buried under a mound of dirt. These three young men didn't die in Eastern Europe. They didn't die in the Middle East. They did not die in Africa or Central or South America. They died right here in our own country, trying to get all of our citizens to become participants in the democratic process. For those of us in the movement, we learned early that our struggle was not for a month or season or school year, but ours was a struggle of a lifetime. That is what it takes to build an all-inclusive world community based on simple justice, an all-inclusive society that value, yes, as I said, the dignity and the worth of every human being. Consider those two words, beloved community. Beloved means not hateful, not violent, not uncaring, not unkind. And community means not separated, not polarized, not locked in struggle. As leaders of the 21st century, you can move our society forward by standing up for what you deeply believe. Stand up, speak up, speak out, speak the truth to power. Those of you in journalism, investigate and use the pen, use the camera, use the microphone as a powerful instrument, as a powerful tool for good. Whatever it is that you care about, whether it is the lingering stains of racism, the futility of war, or preserving our little planet, 
You must find your passion and make your own contribution. You must be maladjusted to the problems and conditions of today. You must find a way to dramatize your issue. And then you must find a way to get in the way. You have to get in the way and make your voices heard. You have an obligation, a mission, and a mandate to do your part. You have a mandate from the martyrs. You have a mandate from the spirit of history to stand up, to speak up, and to speak out. You know, I got arrested a few times, about 40, during the 60s, <laughs> beaten and left bloody and unconscious at the Greyhound bus station during the Freedom Ride in Montgomery in May of 1961, had a concussion on that bridge in Selma in 65. But I come to tell you today that the way of love, the way of peace, the way of nonviolence, a much better way. The people around the world will not be inspired by our bombs, our missiles, and our guns. You must find a way to say, not just to America, but to the world, that war is obsolete as a tool of our foreign policy. Gandhi said, it is nonviolence or nonexistence. Martin Luther King put it another way. We must learn to live together as brothers and sisters, or we will perish as fools. Just maybe, our foremothers and our forefathers all came to this great land in different ships. We all in the same boat now. It doesn't matter whether we're black or white or Latino or Asian American or Native American. It doesn't matter whether we are straight or gay. We are one people, we are one family, we are one house. We all live in the same house. I want to finish by telling you a little story. When I was growing up outside of Troy, Alabama, I had an aunt by the name of Cineva. And my aunt Seneva lived in what we call a shotgun house. She didn't have a green manicured lawn. Had a simple plain dirt yard. I know what I'm talking about because I was born in a shotgun house. Sometime at night, you look up through the holes in the ceiling. You can count the stars. When it would rain, she would get a pail, a bucket, or tub and catch the rainwater. From time to time, she would walk out into the woods and take branches from a darkwood tree and tie these branches together and make a broom. She called that broom the breast broom. And she would sweep this dirt yard clean, sometimes two and three times a week, but especially on a Friday or Saturday because she wanted the dirt yard to look very good during the weekend. I know here at Emerson College, here in this state, here in Boston, here in New England. You don't know what I'm talking about. You've never seen a shotgun house. In a nonviolent sense, a shotgun house is an old house, one way in, one way out, maybe a tin roof, where well, you can bounce a basketball through the front door, and it will go straight out the back door. My Aunt Seneva lived in a shotgun house. But well, one Saturday afternoon, a group of my brothers and sisters and a few of my fresh cousins, about 12 or 15 of us young children, by playing in my Aunt Seneva dirt yard. And an unbelievable storm came up. The wind started blowing, the thunder started rolling, the lightning started flashing, and the rain started beating on the tin roof of this old shotgun house. My aunt became terrified. She started crying. She got all of us little children together and told us to hold hands. And we did as we were told. The wind continued to blow, the thunder continued to roll, the lightning continued to flash and the rain continued to beat on the tin roof of this old shotgun house. And we cried and we cried. And when one corner of this old house appeared to be lifting from its foundation, my aunt had us to walk to that side to try to hold the house down with our little bodies. When the other corner appeared to be lifting, she had us to walk to that side to try to hold the house down with our little bodies. My friends, my young friends, 
My beloved friends, you the graduate of 2009. The storms may come, the wind may blow, the thunder may roll, the lightning may flash, and the rain may beat down on this old house we call Emerson College. Call it the house of Massachusetts, call it the American house, call it the world house. We all live in the same house, and we must never, ever leave the house. We must walk with the wind, and let the spirit of Emerson College be our guide. Thank you very much.